Sachin, uh, I'll leave you to crack on. Um, thank you and welcome everyone uh, to the second session. We'll, uh, uh, this will carry on until we finish. Uh, this will be followed by uh, the, the third um, part of the agenda, which is the uh, medical um, and pharmacology and what's new in heart failure medications. Thanks, Sachin. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dakur. Thank you for giving this opportunity to talk today. Uh, my name is Sachin. I'm one of the cardiology uh, uh, trainees in uh, uh, currently in Pintafield Hospital. Um, so I have given a few talks before um, uh, about uh, cardiac arrhythmias, but today our learning outcomes is going to be mostly about tachyarrhythmias. I thought uh, don't, instead of cramming with loads of arrhythmias, uh, I myself have sat in a class with ECGs and interpretations. It can be a bit difficult and could confuse you completely. So I just thought we just talk about tachyarrhythmias, which most often that UFI2s or interns tend to see more in wards and you'll be called for something like that. So how to interpret tachyarrhythmias? What are the mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias? And how do you manage tachyarrhythmias in a ward when you've been called for somebody like that? So when I tend to give a lecture, uh, my students are always very, very interactive and they just look to be so interested. But actually, when I look in reality, this is what the lecture is. Um, I don't know how much of these people are hiding behind a board and how much of these people are actually sitting in front of a board. Saying that, I'll just go with it. So most often this chat is going, this, most of this talk is going to be about you guys interacting. So feel free to talk because it's going to be ECGs being displayed and asking your comments about it. So I like, to, like you guys to be more involved in it. I can't see the chat screen that are typing. So prefer to talk is better for me if it is possible for you guys. Yeah, I, I, can convey, I can convey to you uh, what's being written in the chat, you know, if people are okay. not um, comfortable to um, speak out. But yeah, okay. I would encourage them to, to write in the chat box and I, I can talk on their behalf. Thanks. Okay, fair enough. So be prompt so that we can finish this early and everybody could have an early break. Um, so SVT literally stands for supraventricular tachycardia. It's quite prevalent. It's prevalent almost two to two and a half percent for every thousand persons. Um, and women tend to have quite a higher risk of developing SVT than men. They're two times more likely to get an SVT compared to men. So in a typical emergency department in everyday settings, the most common SVT that tend to uh, uh, see is atrial fibrillation, followed by AVNRT, followed by atrial flutter, followed by AVRT. So these things could be much more, um, more filtered. As you may understand, SVT is a term that we, is an umbrella term that we say it's a supra ventricular tachycardia. That is everything that is happening above the ventricle. So there is multiple forms of SVT. So one form is atrial fibrillation. Other forms could be AVNRT, atrial flutter, AVRT, or even sinus tachycardia, which could be inappropriate, can be a form of uh, SVT. The most common symptoms that people present with is uh, fatigue, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, chest tightness. Syncope and presyncope, most often we tend to see in older people who don't tend to tolerate a very fast tachyarrhythmia. Younger people do tend to tolerate this tachyarrhythmia because it's sometimes physiological uh, when they do some stress. So they tend to tolerate these kind of tachyarrhythmias. So they don't tend to come with most often syncope or presyncope unless you have a very fast tachyarrhythmia going at 220, 240 beats per minute or something like that. So this is a 21 year old, sorry, this is the case one. It's a 27 year old female. She's been having on and off palpitations ongoing for the past one year. Um, again, for any kind of tachycardia or any kind of tachyarrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia, history is very, very important. It gives you minor clues as to how you can pick it up. Is it a long lasting? Because if it is a short lasting tachyarrhythmia, then it tells you it's just abrupt and it's gone. So you have to ask about the onset of symptoms and how long did it last for? So that kind of helps you to give, uh, uh, is it just a symptomatic PVCs or PACs or do they have some arrhythmias? So it's much more important to just to be more investigative when it comes to asking for arrhythmia duration and what symptoms they have associated with it. Did they so she had no syncope or presyncope. As a part of investigation, she had a halter which showed sinus rhythm with a premature atrial contraction. Again, people should understand a halter is kind of an investigation that we do uh, to investigate for any kind of tachyo arrhythmias, mm -hmm. which could be a hit and miss. It doesn't mean you have a halter monitor and no arrhythmia has been picked up on it means that you don't have any arrhythmia. You can still have an arrhythmia, but the only thing is that you didn't have it picked up. The success rate of picking an arrhythmia on a halter in the first 24 hours to 48 hours, it increases as you leave it for longer. So chance of picking an arrhythmia on a halter in the first 24 hours are almost 20%. 20%. It increases up to 43% for 48 hours. And likewise, if you put it for longer, 
the chance of documenting an arrhythmia is longer. Second thing is you have to ask the duration of symptoms. For example, if this patient is having symptoms once monthly, the chance of a 48-hour halter monitor picking it is quite rare and has to be a pure chance that this is picking up at the moment she's having an arrhythmia. Again, how often is the symptoms happening? If they say everyday occurrence, definitely a halter is going to pick it up. If they say it's going to happen every two monthly or three monthly, then you have to see, if, can we do a prolonged monitor or a loop recorder like uh, Dr. Monojo was speaking before, which can be implanted, can be in longer and helps to diagnose. Or if they don't want an implantable monitor, you can talk about Apple watches or external monitors like Cardia or something like that can be helpful, All right? So this patient literally was in hospital and got palpitations. Uh, she walked straight into ED. And this is the first ECG that we have of this patient who has been having palpitations for one year and we have a documented ECG of this. Any comments on this ECG? Looks like SVT. Okay, so right. SVT, like we said, again, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a umbrella term to say it's a supraventricular tachycardia. Okay, anything else? Any other that you can specify in SVT? Anyone else? Sorry, apologies, we'll go back. So everybody agrees, so you say it's SVT. So what I would say is if you have to describe that ECG for me, there is two ways to describe the ECG. So one is you look at the QRS complex and see is a QRS complex broad or narrow. If it is narrow, then you have a narrow complex rhythm over here and it's tachycardic. So you can say it's a narrow complex tachycardia. The next thing you can describe it is, is it regular or is it irregular? So two ways to describe it is if you are not sure what type of rhythm it is, is it's a regular narrow complex tachycardia. If it is irregular narrow complex tachycardia, the likely diagnosis is going to be either it's an atrial fibrillation or some form of atrial tachycardia. When you're, when you're not sure of a rhythm, again, if you're sure of rhythm, again, you can say, or if you're still not unsure, you can still say it's a regular narrow complex tachycardia, right? So then when you have a regular narrow complex tachycardia, you have a few options. One could be, is it an AVNRT, which is the most common kind of SVT that we tend to see, uh, which has multiple occurrence, AV, sorry, AV and RT. I'm sorry, I'm trying to write on this. So how do we differentiate is that? You have typical AV and RT and atypical AV and RT. How can you differentiate is that? When you have an ECG, look at the QRS complex and you see V1, you can see a small little posture deflection after V1. That is your P wave that has been activated retrogradely. So I'll go back to the chalkboard again. So if you have to look at your heart and have to look at the conduction system again. You have SA node, AV node, and you have base bundle. So AV and RT is something that's happening close to the AV node. And you have an, a slow and fast pathway mechanism. And usually it's a premature atrial contraction that activates a slow pathway. By the time your normal conduction has gone through the fast pathway and the slow pathway activates a fast pathway and the arrhythmia is just caught in over here. So because it is close to the ventricle, it activates the ventricle first, and then it activates the atrium retrogradely. So that's what happens. You can see that you get a QRS complex first coming up and then you have a retrograde atrial activation of the P wave. So this is how you can diagnose an AV and RT. So this is what you see a QRS complex and the P wave. So this is your typical AV and RT. Not all the time you'll see this ECG, but it is worthwhile if you're not sure what type of rhythm you have to look at a closer look at ECG, look at the QRS complex, look closely after that. You see a positive deflection after that. This is called a pseudo R prime which you typically see in AVNRTs. So this woman has walked into hospital, has this rhythm, is an E. What are you going to do for this lady who has walked into hospital with this tachyarrhythmia? Anybody there for treatment options? Would you not need, want to assess whether she was hemodynamically well, she's had any syncopal episodes, see whether she, which side of the tachycardia algorithm you go down. Okay, she had palpitations and she walked into hospital. So she is talking to you, so she hasn't had any syncope. And from the history, we don't have any syncopal episodes. So, you probably so she's sitting and talking to you in ED. You start with Valsalva maneuvers. Okay, uh, Valsalva failed. What can you do? Uh, well, you 
you then start thinking about things like adenosine. Okay. So what other options we have other than Valsava? So how do you do Valsava when you're around this patient now? Anybody knows how to do a proper Valsava maneuver? So there is two types of Valsava maneuver that people have been taught about. Is your older classical Valsava maneuver where they actually either ask you to give you a plunger and ask you to blow through it, uh, trying to raise the interthoracic pressure. That is one way to do it. Watch. There was a study that they published from, it, from Turkey actually, where they randomized people to have a modified Valsava and a regular Valsava, which means they gave them a plunger, asked them to blow, as they were blowing, they just lift the legs up and they just made them fly supine. So when they did that, the rate of conversion of people going from SVT or AVNRT to sinus was quite higher compared to just regular Valsava. So if you're going to do a Valsava, it's better to do a modified Valsava rather than just doing a regular uh, Valsava. That's number one. Second thing is you can do a character sinus massage. These are all class one indication before you can do something. Uh, which patient population would you be more careful before you do a character sinus massage? People who you know have got carotid artery disease, like who might have a stroke. Exactly. So people who had stroke, people who you know has uh, established car carotid disease, you won't touch their carotids because you can give them a stroke. Or even older people, generally you don't know what kind of risk they come with. So age above 65, I would be more cautious on them to do a character sinus massage. Um, when you're doing a character sinus massage, it's not just you just rub on the neck, it just goes off. You have to actually feel palpate for a character artery and actually massage the character artery at least for 10 seconds before you can see some effect on it. You're trying to stimulate the vagus nerve that is going to act on the AV node to stop this uh, rhythm to be furthermore continuing on. So again, be more careful with older people because you can actually give them a stroke, which we don't want it. So Valsava maneuver has failed and Somebody has mentioned adenosine. That's very good. So how are we going to give adenosine for someone who has come to ED with this kind of rhythm? Have you guys ever given adenosine? A lot, it'd be a large um, bar cannula, preferably like in the uh, anterior cubital fossa. Exactly, yes. You have a large bar cannula, you have to give an anterior cubital fossa, but what else are you going to do after that? So when you're giving adenosine, the half-life is, is within seconds. Within 10, 20 seconds, it's gone. So it's no point giving a blue cannula in a hand. So you should have it in a cubital force, at least a pink or a green cannula, and make sure you have a 20 mil flush. So it's ideal if you have a three-way tap, connect the adenosine to one tap and flush on the other tap. The moment you give the adenosine, make sure you give that large bolus of 20 mils of normal cell and go through that and try to lift the hand up if possible. If not, it's okay. So it can have an effect on the AV node to block this uh, rhythm and to see if it can be cardioverted. okay? So how much of adenosine are you going to give for somebody who's coming with AV and RT? So somebody has said, uh, Dr. Parker has said, so 6, 12, 12, yeah, exactly, yes. So that is the adenosine that you're going to give, brilliant. So I'll go on to my next slide. There is two rhythm steps. I think, I think I've tried 6, 6, 12, sorry. Yes, 6, 12, uh, 12. So there's two rhythm steps over here. So there's two rhythm steps over here. Both people, if you look at my cursors, you can see they are going a narrow complex tachycardia, which is quite fast on both ECGs. But the reason why adenosine, when you give it, you have to connect to paddles and you have to have the strippers because it can give you an idea what type of exact SVT they have. So if you look at my first ECG strip, it's narrow complex tachycardia but once it terminates, it's terminating with a QRS complex and you get a regular QRS complex after that. You have some PVCs after that. So this happens mostly in ABRT. So atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, which is also a form of supraventricular tachycardia. The second patient over here is narrow complex tachycardia. Again, when it terminates, it's terminating with a P wave over here. When it terminates with a P wave, it's typical for AVNRT, which is atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. So once you do this, it's not just, okay, I have achieved sinus, that's it, a diagnosis made and I treated this patient, you walk away. But again, it's more good for you to put your heads in and to actually look into the rhythm step, what actually happened, because that can give you a diagnosis of what type of arrhythmia you're dealing with. So something over here that is terminating with the QRS complex and you're getting a regular QRS sinus activity after that tells you it's a AVRT, I repeat it again, it's an atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia something that is terminating with a P wave tells you it's an ABNRT, which means it's an atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. So that's how we can differentiate 
both type of arrhythmias, both happening close to AV node or could be far away from AV node if it's AVRT. One of the form of AVRT is Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which Dr. Manoj was talking earlier on. So this all helps you to differentiate. So it's better to look at that ECG once you give arnesine to put your microscope more closer so you can get a proper diagnosis. Okay. Fair enough. So we give an adenosine, we got this. So like we said, the most common pre precursor for this type of arrhythmias is either a PAC, premature atrial contraction, or PVC, a premature ventral contraction. So this is one ECG. If you look on top, this is an ECG from ambulance. So a patient called an ambulance because he was getting palpitations and feeling dizzy and light headed. This was a 24 year old male. He felt his pulse, his pulse was going around 210. So ambulance went to his house, did an ECG, was in sinus, and subsequently, what happened? Can anyone tell me what happened with this first ECG? To interrupt, but I think views are still stuck on slide seven. We can't actually see the new ECG. We can still see the um, the slide seven from earlier. Are you able to see now? Apologies. No. I think it's number seven seen, uh, Sachin. Oh, I'm uh, able to move my slides over here. Shall I stop and share again? I'll, yeah. I'll stop and share again. Let's see if that works. Can you see my slides? Yeah. So let me go back again. Can you see my ECG slides now? Yeah. Okay. So this is the rhythm step that I was talking about. So again, I'll come back. I'll, I'll talk about this again. So you can see a narrow complex tachycardia over here. Once the moment adenosine is given, you can see this narrow complex tachycardia, whatever arrhythmia we had, is just terminating with the QRS complex and we have a regular PQC happening after that. So which means this arrhythmia has terminated with the QRS complex, which tells me it's the AVRT, which is AV atrioventricular renal tachycardia. But if you look at the step downwards, it's again a narrow complex tachycardia, which is going past. It terminates at the P wave over here, and then you get normal sinus rhythm. This tells me it's an AVNRT. So once you give adenosine, it's much more better if you just look at the ECG strips to see what you're getting. Is it a regular narrow complex tachycardia, which is AVRT or AVNRT, which will be helpful for you to differentiate. So that's how we can see this kind of arrhythmias, and you can, we'll be able to differentiate between AVRTs, AVNRTs, or is it a flutter? If it's a flutter, what you're going to see is you'll just see incessant flutter waves after that, and then you'll see QRS complex. So once you give the adenosine, it gives you a good bit of information, what type of rhythm you're dealing with. If it's a flutter waves that you see, there is no point giving adenosine anymore. It's better to stop at that point. You know you're dealing with the flutter. Because it is going too fast, it's difficult to appreciate what type of arrhythmias they have. So that's why the moment you give some powerful AV nodal blocking agent, it's better to look at the rhythm, what it actually does after it's acting on the AV node. So my next slide, can you guys see this? So this is a 24-year-old gentleman who has had uh, quite a lot of palpitations and felt his pulse to be around 200 beats per minute and felt dizzy and lighted. I called an ambulance and an ambulance reached. He was found to be in sinus, but still they did an ECG on him. Can anybody say what is wrong with the first ECG on the red strip over here? Any comments on that ECG? Oh, sorry. So I'm not able to see the comments. I'm sorry about that. Um, so what's, what's going on on the first strip? Um, what's going on? People can type. Yeah, so there's a response. Uh, uh, sinus rhythm converted to regular so, narrow complex tachy. There's one answer coming in, one, one response. Brilliant. So if you're like, like I said, that's brilliant. If you're not able to say what type of rhythm you're able to, at least saying regular narrow complex tachy is very helpful. At least you know what you're dealing with. So again, so somebody was going in sinus and all of a sudden they've gone into some regular narrow complex tachycardia is what it looks like. But if you put your microscope more closer, look at the RR interval, this seems to be happening much more quicker, which the morphology seems to be more like a PVC kind of morphology or PAC, whichever you can call it. And then it's just kind of activated axillary pathway that put them into a quite regular narrow complex tachycardia. So if I have to give an adenosine on him, which was for this patient, which actually showed me, which was an AVRT, which was activated by a PVC, which came from a ventricle. So that gives me a diagnosis. And this helps for people for treatment and further as they come in future for more uh, further treatments, which, we'll, which I'll talk about in next slides. Because if you look at it, it's going way too faster. It's almost going at 200 beats per minute, which 
can sometimes can cause cardiac compromise, can cause syncope. So these people can have different type of treatment options rather than just your regular cascade of treatments, which I will go back again. Um, this is another ECG step downwards. Both are same from the same patient who got three lots of adenosine uh, for presumed SVT. Can anybody comment on these two rhythm strips that you have down here? What do you think has happened? And again, I'll say this is the region where you had adenosine coming in, and this is the region where you have adenosine coming in. So any comment on these two rhythm strips downstairs when they just kept on giving adenosine, thinking it's uh, SVT? Anybody? So there's a there's a question if it's a query atrial flutter or flutter. Uh, good thinking, but flutter, if you look at it, if you have to map it, it's going way faster than 300, that is less likely, but it could be a form of coarse atrial fibrillation. Even if you look at the RR interval, if you map it, it's not regular, it's irregular. So this is what can happen when somebody is going that fast. It's sometimes that difficult to appreciate. Is it SVT or is it AFib? In which cases, what you have to do is you just take a paper, mark three complex of R, and then try to map it with the other three complex of RR. See if it matches. Even if it doesn't match remotely, then it could be atrial fibrillation. It's going so fast that you're not able to appreciate that it is, it is irregular. So when you got adenosine, you can actually see it's actually coarse AF, which just you can see loads of atrial activity happening. And then again, it goes back into irregular rhythm back again over here. And then they gave another adenosine, thinking is he's in SVT, so would it work? And they asked me to have a look. And when I had a look at it, the diagnosis was pretty clear that he had a coarse atrial fibrillation and adenosine is not going to work for this patient, right? So that's why it's very, very careful when somebody has said, I have given this patient adenosine, it's almost always you have to make sure the patient is on a, a cardiac monitor where you will be able to print off a strip so you can actually see what did that adenosine do because adenosine is a powerful AV node blocking agent and it's going to reveal something at the AV node that's going to reveal something for atrial activity. So be very, very pedantic when you're looking at ECGs post adenosine. That is going to give you some diagnosis. Otherwise, you'll be still looking for some diagnosis and the treatment could be delayed. So this helps a lot when you're not sure about diagnosis. Is that okay? Any questions from anybody? I was just uh, typing on the chat session that as covered in the previous um, Manoj's session where there was a pre-excitation and SVT, you know, there's another example where you have faster rates and, um, and also commenting that um, in our times, um, we used to have calipers in our pockets um, just to um, be able to quickly measure the RR intervals and to be able to say whether uh, it's, it's regular or irregular. Irregular, exactly. Uh, it helps. It's all back to school, back to basics, isn't it? So measuring the RR interval helps a lot for you to give a diagnosis as well. But again, if you're not sure, again, giving adenosine helps. In which patient population would be more careful when you're giving adenosine? Any ideas? Who would you be trying to avoid adenosine? Asthmatics. Well, who? Asthmatics, exactly. Why would you avoid uh, adenosine asthmatics? It works on the C fibers on the bronchus and can cause bronchospasm. So that's why you avoid adenosine in asthmatics. And do you know how you're going to reverse adenosine? So somebody you gave adenosine on and he's now in a severe bronchospasm, how are you going to re reverse adenosine? So you give Tiaflin. So giving adenosine is not a simple medication. As we said, it's a powerful AV nodal blocking agent. So which means, which means some people can have profound AV nodal blocking and they can just go completely asystolic or bradycardic. So if you have something like that, make sure you can pace them transcutaneously or have an atropine, which can reverse AV nodal blocking properties. So just not just give adenosine. You should also be prepared. What are the eventualities that can happen? So that's why you should always put them on a cardiac monitor or a defibrillator where you can pace them if needed or have an atropine so that you can give it if they have a profound AV nodal blocking and they're just not going to come back to you back again. So it helps. So you should always be anticipatory and don't give adenosine before you have a reversal agent next to you before you can do that. So that's what you can do. Theophylline is not readily available. Not many people are going to have it. So again, you're not going to give asthmatics. So you don't have to have theophylline to give adenosine. So avoid it in asthmatics. In COPD patients, you can give it. So just be more careful about AV nodal blocking. So just have something to give some, uh, if they go profound AV or blocked, just have something for it, like an atrophy in your hand to give it in case if they are completely blocked in the AV node. And again, it's going to be transient. 
within six to eight seconds is going to be gone. For that six to eight seconds is going to be pretty much off of palpitations for yourself and you're going to get an SVT from what you see on the monitor. So just be prepared for every eventualities. Is that okay? So management again, if you see an SVT, again, it's the most important thing is to know about hemodynamics. I don't know who's talking to me. I'm sorry about it. I don't know your name. But again, anybody who comes with SVTs or any kind of tachyarrhythmias, the main thing you want to know is hemodynamic status. I'm sorry. Are they hemodynamically stable? Which means you have to check the blood pressure. If they are not hemodynamically stable, then you have to straight away go for cardioversion. There is no waiting for adenosine or Valsava or any of those medications. Hemodynamically unstable, straight away go to cardioward. How are you going to cardio with these patients? Does anybody, has anybody seen a cardio version before? Synchronized DC shock. Why do you do a synchronized DC shock? Uh, it's because otherwise, if you don't try and sync the shock with, with the underlying ryth rhythm, it can put them into ventricular fibrillation. Exactly. So what you want to do is you want to shock the rhythm and actually the ventricle has been depolarized. When you get the depolarization of the ventricles, you get a QRS complex. You want the current to go through when the ventricle is depolarized. If the current falls on a T wave, it's what you call a R on T phenomena, which is basically can put them into a torsor RBF. So you don't want to do that. All the newer uh, machines that you have defibrillators have that options called synchronization. So anybody who is alive and talking to you, you use a synchronized cardio version. Anybody was practically dead in a cardiac arrest situation, you do, you do defibrillation. That's the difference where you don't synchronize it. You just throw a current onto them, see if you can get any kind of rhythm from what they are in. So if they're alive and talking to you and they're hemodynamically unstable, you're going to cardio with them. Even if it is VT, if they're still alive and talking to you, you do a synchronized cardio version compared to VT in a cardiac arrest where you defibrillate them, okay? So anybody, who is hemodynamically unstable, but still alive and talking to you and everything. You just have to synchronize cardioversion compared to population. Otherwise, you go step by step, do a cardiac massage or a valsava or modified valsava is most preferred. You can give adenosine between 16 to 18 milligrams to see if it helps. You can try IV beta blockers or IV verapamil. Again, be cautious in people who you're going to give verapamil or non dihydropyridin cal channel blockers like verapamil or deltaism. In people age over 65, or anybody who has coronary artery disease, if the LV function is less than 40%, cal channel blockers are contraindicated. So you can't give them. So before you do that, it's, that's why I said taking a history is very important. So if they are known to have a poor LV function, you don't give them barapamol, in which case you stick with beta blockers. Sometimes if they're refracted to medication, you can actually cardio with them. It's still an AVNRT or some kind of supramental arrhythmia, which is safe to cardio with. So you just go for the next step to cardio with them. All right. The last treatment option is this one, it's called an ablation. Basically what it means is, um, as we said, it's AV and RT, so it's most likely coming close to AV node or from somewhere between atrium and ventricle. They can actually go around, do a mapping in the ventricle or the atrium and actually burn that slow or fast conducting pathway so that that is completely burned off and they don't get this arrhythmia anymore. So that is something that can be considered. And which people needs to be prioritized are these people who are running too fast like this. 200, 240 bits a minute are the people who are more higher risk than people who are a little bit less uh, are not that fast. Again, any invasive procedure has its own uh, risk and complications. The most common risk and complication is causing damage to the heart muscle, either or to the esophagus. Sometimes you can get ulcers because if you do laser ablation, or you can actually end up getting a pacemakers because it's close to the AV node. There's a risk of you ablating the AV node and then them ending up, ending up with a pacemaker. So not much people prefer it. So in long-term management, either you can offer them drugs with beta blockers regularly, or you can add on extra medications like flaconite if the heart rate is actually normal. And again, it's always important to keep EP cardiologists in loop so that these kind of rhythms can be ablated and there is 96% curative rate for AV and RTs. So they won't have to suffer this again. If they're quite incessant with their arrhythmias and quite symptomatic, you can actually refer them for ablation with EP cardiologist. So that's the, this will be an escalation of treatment. So scratch massage, tails, adenosine, IV beta blockers, or verapamil. If they're reverted, then fine. You can give them regular beta blockers, add on extra antiarrhythmic, and again, always have ablation in your back of your head so that you can refer them for ablation, which is almost 96% curative. And if you're sending somebody for ablation, make sure your referral letter has a copy of the ECG with the fast rhythm. It's, it's difficult for somebody without ECGs to say where exactly it is. 
people see ECGs different way, and EP cardiologists definitely can say 10 differential diagnosis on an ECG that we don't see it. So they look at ECGs different. So an ECG should go with the ablation referral, no matter what day and what level of your career you're in. If you're sending somebody for ablation, make sure there's an ECG accompanying with the referral letter. Is it okay? Any questions before I move on? Happy to move? Okay. Next case is a 74-year-old female who has been complaining of shortness of breath and palpitations. She has a background history of uh, TIA uh, two years ago, type 2 diabetes and hypertension. She's on aspirin, metformin, ramipril, and atrostatin. So she walked through her GP services and GP did an ECG and this ECG that I have. Any comments on this ECG? Anybody out there? Any comments on this ECG? Again, if I have to go by step by step, again, it's a narrow complex QRS. It's tachycardic. So I have a narrow complex tachycardia. Is the RR interval regular? If it is not, then I have an irregular narrow complex tachycardia. The most likely diagnosis is going to be atrial fibrillation, right? So you can do a step by step mechanism that's going to be very helpful, which will be able to tell you what type of rhythm I have. So it's a regular, narrow, irregular, narrow complex tachycardia absent P waves, so which most likely tells me, which is an atrial fibrillation. So how are you going to manage this patient? Any acres for management? Are you worried about uh, the heart rate um, of people who are attending session by looking at the ECG? Are you really worried about the ECG and the, and the heart rate in particular? I think I need to buy coffee for everybody next time before I start an ECG. So there is, there is, um, there's a response, uh, rate control and rhythm control. Okay, fair enough. And so, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. So rate control and rhythm control at one go is not the preferred option. So always start with rate control with beta blockers or a calcium channel blockers or with digoxin, whichever medications. Is, is available. So start off with rate control, see what you can do. Any rate control is said to be a good rate control in acute setting if the heart rate was less than 110. You don't want them to bring back to 60 beats a minute. All you want them to do is that get them out of symptoms and, and have rate control less than 110 in acute setting is all you want. You don't want to be too aggressive. So give them some beta blockers and not just give five of metaprol IV and they haven't done anything and this patient needs admission, not likely. So be more generous. Uh, when you give oral metoprolol, you give quite a high dose of metoprolol. So just giving five milligrams of metoprolol, it's not going to do much for them. Be but generous. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Sachin, but there's yes. another response which came in just, just after, yeah, yeah, I mean, was, uh, I think that's relevant to, to the context here. Uh, yes. Quite, quite an appropriate, a very appropriate response. A check for adverse effects, uh, yeah. like syncope, chest pain, signs of shock, or heart failure. Exactly. So definitely. So you're going to take a history, you're going to examine them, see if they're in heart failure, see if they're having ongoing symptoms. They could have chest pain because they are going to tachycardic and that itself may lead to uh, increased oxygen consumption in the heart and they can cause symptomatic angina because of the tachyarrhythmia itself on its own. Uh, sometimes some clues that you can get is that you can have some rate related changes. You can see some ST depression or something like that on ECGs that can be of, uh, of a clue. If they're clinically grossly in overload or volume overload and heart failure, that can give them a heart failure, uh, atrial fibrillation. So there are certain things that can guide you in, in treatment. And hemodynamics, obviously, like I said, uh, anybody who's in tachyarrhythmia, first thing you want to know is the hemodynamic status. Brilliant, that's very good. So hemodynamically stable, not in any sense of heart failure. GP referred him to ED because he was worried about the tachyarrhythmia. Um, we say rate control, we've given them some beta blockers, good dose of beta blockers, and then what are you going to do next? Anything else after giving rate control, rhythm control, what are you going to do for them? What other medication is very, very essential for them? Chad, you'd work out the, you'd probably work, work out the Chad's VAST score on anticoagulate. Any score that you would use not to anticoagulate them? Has blood. Has blood, okay, fair enough. Again, has blood score on its own shouldn't be something that you're going to say, you have a high has blood score, I'm not going to anticoagulate you. Some has blood score, some aspects of it are reversible, some are not reversible. Like the H stands for hypotension. 
doesn't mean they have hypertension. You're going to not going to anticoagulate them, and that's a score, which means there's a resistant hypertension, anything more than 160. So that can be reversible. So when somebody has a high HASP that score, just have a chat with them and say the risk of stroke is much higher compared to you having a bleeding risk. So you can always have the discussion and you can actually see if there is something that can be reversed and treat it and you can give them some anticoagulation. Okay, has that score and chance that score, you're going to anticoagulate them. Anything else you want to? On which occasions would you think this patient cannot be anticoagulated? So you ask, you hear a murmur. And then you ask for an echocardiogram. Echo is done, which says LV function is very good, has moderate to severe mitral regurgitation with moderate pulmonary hypertension. Can this patient be anticoagulated with a NOVAC? Any answers? Is it yes or no? Can this patient get a NOVAC? Not if they're going to need a valve replacement because it's not licensed, you'd have to give warfarin. Okay, so it's moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. So at this point in time, I don't think they're going to get a valve replacement based on moderate regurgitation. Okay, anything else? Do you think with the mitral regurgitation, would you still be comfortable giving them NOVAC? So I'll go on to my next slide. You can is the answer. The only time when you're not going to give a NOVAC for somebody is when they have moderate to severe mitral stenosis. A mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation doesn't have any contraindication for NOVAC. It's only mitral stenosis has a contraindication for a NOVAC. Again, it has to be moderate to severe. The reason why is because, again, I'll go back to my drawing board. If you have to think about it, atrium to ventricle is a low flow uh, state. The pressure across the atrium and ventricle to contract doesn't need to be too much for the atrium to give blood to the ventricle. When you have stenosis, then there is only less flow going across the stenotic valve. So there is a high grade of, of hemostasis over there, which is more prothrombotic and NOVAC tends to not block all the thrombus or dissolve all the thrombus that is forming over there, in which cases you need a warfarin. So moderate to severe mitral stenosis is the only time when you're going to say this patient doesn't need a NOVAC. It's no longer set as valvular AF and non-valvular AF. The reason being because of the confusion that it caused. Lots of people thought, okay, this patient has atrial uh, aortic stenosis, has aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. So NOVAC is contraindicated. Actually, it is not. So that term is actually taken off books. So we don't anymore use a valvular AF and a non-valvular AF. So everything is either a new diagnosis of AF, paroxysmal AF, persistent AF, permanent AF is what you use. No more a valvular AF and non-valvular AF. So you get an echocardiogram to see if there is evidence of moderate to severe mitral stenosis. Again, moderate to severe mitral stenosis is something of a rheumatological fever is what most commonly causes it. So you might see this more in developed countries. I'm sorry, in developing countries, not in developed countries. So it's extremely rare you see a mitral stenosis in a developed country. So, but it's worthwhile to have a keep an eye on for it. So second contraindication could be a mechanical prosthetic valve. And third contraindication could be a pregnancy. And fourth contraindication is severe liver disease can be a contraindication for, uh, for uh, uh, NOVAC. Otherwise, everybody gets a NOVAC. And again, be more careful about CKD as well. If they have very poor uh, LV, uh, poor creatinine clearance, again, that is another contraindication for NOVAC. There are trials ongoing for people to be on NOVAC who are getting dialysis, but we don't have the results of it yet. In future, things might change. So keep an eye out for the up-to-date guidelines. But at the moment in time, Poor kidney function, I'm sorry, I don't have it there with a very poor creatinine clearance of less than 15 or 30, depending upon the NOVAC you choose. And again, moderate mitral stenosis is only valve that you think about not to put them on NOVAC. Okay, fair enough. Any questions before I move on? I'm not talking too fast or I'm not going too fast. So, okay, so next easy. Sorry, yeah. I'm just saying it's perfect speed. Okay. Uh, it, might, it might just be a good idea just to briefly, um, maybe in one short sentence, some of the, the DOAC uh, situation currently in terms of the options which we have locally versus um, globally, et cetera. Because people might so, just fix up answer. Yes. So the most commonly preserved NOVAC tends to be a Pixaban, which is a twice daily dose. The, it, it's based on three different things. One is your weight, creatinine clearance, and age. So if they fit two out of three, which means weight more than 60 kilograms, if the age is less than 85, 
and the creatinine level, EGFR, I'm not sure. I think it's 30, more than 30 or 40, I'm not sure. Then you can give them a uh, full dose of Novak, which is five milligrams PD. And if any of those is it, if they meet two, if they're less than 60 kilograms, age more than 85, then you can still think about low dose of epixaban, which is 2.5. Again, talk to your patients, see how they are when they comes to taking medications. Because if you are somebody who's you think complaints could be an issue, you can still think about edoxaban, which is only once daily dose. Again, you have two doses on them, 30 and 60 milligrams. Rivaroxaban, again, two, has two doses based on renal function, which is 20 and 15 milligrams. Dabigatran is another medication that we tend to use, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, as opposed to all the other Novaks, which are factor 10A inhibitors, um, which is 110 milligrams and 150 milligrams. Um, Dabigatran has a reversal agent. Uh, Novax also recently has approved for a reversal agent called Antizinet Alpha, which you can give, uh, which is most often quite expensive, reversed, used in very high grade or very severe intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, is what you use. Otherwise, if they have any kind of other bleedings, it's better to talk with hematology, see if they can give some fresh frozen plasma or, or any kind of um, coagulation factors that can be given to stop the bleeding. So that's what you can do for uh, anticoagulation wise. So this would, this, so like I said, epix one being the most commonly prescribed. Again, see your patients, how they are, who is more easy to take the medications and compense issues. Once they dose is much more easier for some people, so you can choose which NOAC you want to give. Case number three is a 48-year-old male. He has a four-week history of progressive shortness of breath, increasing in fetal edema and orthopnea. His past medical history is nothing significant, but he drinks quite heavy, 60 units a week. Uh, on examination, when he came, he was quite tachycardic, 140 beats per minute. His blood pressure was somewhere around 110 or 65. On examination, he had raised JVP, he had creps in his both base of the lungs, and he had fetal edema marked up to his knees quite thick take chunky lugs. So that's the ECG we have when he initially came to hospital. Any comments on the ECG? Oh, sorry. Anybody? So again, let's go back to our uh, algorithm again. If you're struggling to find what it is, describe the QRS complex as a regular or narrow. If it is narrow, anything less than three small boxes, you have a narrow complex. It's a tachycardic, yes. So you have a regular narrow complex tachycardia. Then you have to figure out what type of tachycardia you have, which is a regular narrow complex tachycardia. So going back to my drawing board, so like I said, one is AVNRT that we talked about. Second one that could be is AVRT that I talked about as well, that you can differentiate with ECG. So that is a regular narrow complex tachycardia, which could almost be similar with the AVNRT. Third is, is atrial flutter. Okay, again, it's another form of axillary pathway conduction. So, which is another form of regular narrow complex tachycardia, which is called atrial flutter. So, what you see is if you have to take this QRS complex out of context, so if I have to hide this QRS complex completely, you typically see a sawtooth, this one. So, typical sawtooth up here is fixed rate almost at 135, whatever it is, beats per minute, which is most likely coming to telling me it's a flutter. The best lead to see for flutter waves in a typical or atypical flutter is lead B1 again and inferior leads. So you can see this is your flutter waves. So every two flutter waves is conducting a QRS complex. Every two flutter waves conducting a QRS complex. You won't be able to appreciate other leads. And again, if you go into inferior leads, you can see the sawtooth appearance very typically. But lead B1 is almost always very useful to identify these kind of flutter waves. So you can see every two is to one connection is what you have over here, which is a fast flutter. So this gentleman has come with six week history of shortness of breath and he's in heart failure. So what are you going to do for this gentleman? Any comments on it? Dr. Thakur, are you seeing any comments? Do you not need cardioverting if he's got heart failure due to his- So he's six weeks of, uh, of, uh, of this rhythm, most likely you don't know what's the duration of onset of symptoms. If you're going to cardiovert without anticoagulation, what is the risk of a stroke? So what symptoms do you expect with uh, this sort of uh, ECG um, with this sort of a heart rate? So that's the kind of thing to perhaps consider. Yeah. So his main symptoms are only shortness of breath. He's not having any palpitations and his blood pressure is stable. There is no urgent indication for it to cardio work. Again, you still go through your log algorithm back again. So he's in heart failure. 
So you want to give them some heart failure medications. And again, you want to control this rate. Again, go your step-by-step -step algorithm, beta blocker or calcium channel blockers. I wouldn't be keen on giving it because he is symptomatically in heart failure. Without knowing the LV function, I won't give any kind of calcium channel blockers on him. Um, so in which case, I will go with beta blockers, digoxin, if needed, amiodrone can be considered. So these are the algorithms that I would follow on this gentleman. And get an echocardiogram to actually look how the ventricle is, what, what the ventricle is doing, what's his LV function like and everything. So we did that. And after getting a good dose of beta blocker, after getting diuresed, after being on digoxin, and consideration of adding from your is still going fast, and his heart failure is still refractory and he's still in heart failure, what are you going to do for him? This is a week into hospital admission. Any takers? The answer has already been mentioned. So you can think about cardioverting these people. Again, how are you going to cardiovert them? Is this, okay? I just made up this algorithm. So when somebody comes with symptomatic atrial fibrillation or flutter, you have to see the onset of symptoms. Is it less than 40 hours or greater than 40 hours? These people who comes with onset of symptoms less than 40 hours are mostly young people. Older people, as we see the constellation of symptoms could be shortness of breath, some dizziness, palpitations, they tend to put up with it. And most often they don't come with 40 hours of onset. So I don't trust them. So I don't tend to push them into cardioversion early. So younger people, the moment something is wrong, they just rush into hospital and they get diagnosis. And you clearly know when is the onset of symptoms. If the onset of symptom is less than 48 hours and you can, you are safe to do a synchronous cardioversion on them. Either you can do it with current or chemically with flaconide, if you know the LV function, or if the structural heart is structurally normal, you can do that. A recent ESC update has said, you can actually wait on this patient with symptomatic atrial fibrillation because almost 70% of people tend to revert to sinus spontaneously within 48 hours. So there is no point of us rushing and doing all these kind of things. So waiting and giving them beta blockers can also be helpful. But if you think this patient is a cardioversion, still you can consider it with less than 48 hours. If the onset of symptoms is between 24 to 48 hours, you still have to anticoagulate them after cardioversion. Post cardioversion, you still have to anticoagulate them. If the symptom is more than 48 hours, you want to see how the hemodynamic is. Are they hemodynamically stable or unstable? If they're unstable, you have to do a synchronized cardioversion on them and make sure you anticoagulate them after cardioversion. The chances are, when you cardiovert somebody without an anticoagulation is that there is a 6% chance of them having stroke. So, which is quite high enough, which means six in 100 get a stroke is quite high enough. So you have to have the discussion with the patient. But again, if you don't cardiovert them, the risk of them dying is much more higher. So you tend to bite that bullet and you tend to cardiovert them. So uh, you go down this pathway. If the blood pressure is stable, you opt for rate control with beta blockers or calcium blockers or digoxin. Again, if they're still not yet, then you can think about rhythm control after anticoagulating for three weeks at least before you can think about rhythm control with shocks or drugs, something that could be possible. Or like our gentleman who's 40 year old, who's still in symptomatic heart failure, let's say, and is still going fast, you can think about this thing called a TOE cardioversion, which means a trans esophageal echocardiography, where you look at the ventricle and atrium much more closer, and you're looking for a typically a left atrial appendage which is like a appendix in the top chamber of the heart where most of the clots form. If it is clear and you don't see any significant clots, then you can cardio with this gentleman. So those are the options you have. So somebody who's more than 40 hours, you can't straight away cardio with them because the risk of stroke is there. So you can think about a TOE guided cardio You can't cardio with them without a TOE guided. In TOE, if they have a significant uh, clot burden or uh, risk of thrombus formation with spontaneous echo contrast, then you can't cardio with them, in which case, you at least try to anticoagulate them minimum of three weeks. It has to be more than three weeks. And then you think about a synchronous cardioversion. Okay, happy with this algorithm? So what does ESC say is about supramental tachyarrhythmia is, again, you can see it's a class 1B recommendation. So I have ablation in your back head. If somebody comes with the, with the SVT, uh, ablation is a good treatment. And again, start off with beta blockers. Any kind of beta, uh, uh, SVTs, it's very good. It's a strong indication to start off with beta blockers. Sometimes if they're going too fast, you can have this thing called a tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy, which means the ventricle is running a marathon 24 seven. It gets weaker and you get a cardiomyopathy because of it. They tend to benefit much from beta blockers. And then second thing is, if somebody has a heart failure, which you don't know the cause and symptoms sense that they are having palpitations and everything, you can still consider for 24 hour monitoring to capture this arrhythmia. And even after doing all those, for example, this gentleman, 
he had beta blockers, digoxin, amiodrone, he tried synchronous cardioversion, and he's still stuck in the atrial flutter, and you have no chances of him taking out of atrial fibrillation, and you're given all the chances, what you can do is called the AV nodal ablation. So basically, going back to my drawing board, you ablate the AV node completely, and you do a dual chamber uh, pacemaker so that the ventricles are contracting. That will be the last option if somebody has tachycardia mediated cardiac myopathy and you have exhausted all options for treatment, you can do that. Is that okay? So that will be our guidelines for somebody who has SVT. And la latest update of ESC guidelines from this last year, what to do for people with atrial fibrillation. So again, you have to see, are they heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, HFPEF, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Do they have severe asthma or COPD? Then do they have any pre excitation which means atrial flutter or any kind of atrial rhythm? Then you have to think about ablation. Then again, as you can see, beta blocker tends to be the first line of treatment. Only in these kind of people, you think about non dihydrofitin catch channel blockers, which is deltaism or verapamil. And again, you have to know their LV function before you can give that. It's not in the line of HFREF, as you can see. So again, reassess them clinically, suboptimal rate control, which means, like I said, in acute settings, you don't want the rate to be less than 100. You don't want to be to 60 or 70 to be perfect. Anything less than 110, very happy with it. If it's still more than 110, and again, see if you can increase the beta blocker or adding on second line of medication like digoxin or non dihydropyridine calcium blockers in a HEP-PEP situation. If it is not, then again, you can see the second line comes over here as amiodrone or digoxin. So when you're giving amiodrone, look for long QT before you start somebody on amiodrone, educate them about the side effects of amiodrone. The half-life of amiodrone is 90 days, so they're pretty toxic. Check their thyroid functions because they can cause both type of thyroid dysfunction, can cause hypo or hypothyroidism, so make sure you check their thyroid functions. So these are the things that you're going to do. When they are all resistant to this medication, again, you can see on the third line of treatment, you're going to ablate them and do a, do a CRTP or CRTD. So literally, if they fail everything and if they're still resistant and they're not getting good beta, beta blocker control, you go back again, completely ablate the AV node. So no matter what happens in the ATM, it's not connected to the ventricle. So the ventricle can be paced with a device called a CRT, which is a cardiac resynchronization therapy. All right, any questions, guys? Before I move on to my next slide. Okay, so... This is a 65-year-old male who's been coming with palpitations and presyncope. He has a previous history of ischemic heart disease and recently had an echocardiogram which showed his LV functions around 30%. Post bypass, his LV function was normal. So he had cardiology follow-up and then he was discharged. But then recently, he got a bit of breathlessness and palpitations and GP arranged for an echocardiogram and his LV function was found to be around 30%. He walked into ED with his palpitations and presyncope and ECG is done. Any comments on this ECG? Ventricular to talk. cardia. Sorry? Ventricular tachycardia. Okay. That's one way to describe it. Fair enough. So again, regular I would Regular, broad, complex uh, Brilliant. tachycardia. Very good. So again, so going back to my chalkboard, so this is, we said our SVTs. So AVNRT, AVRT, atrial flutter, we said. So this is narrow complex tachycardia, which are regular. If I have to say broad complex tachycardia, then again, that can be either you go regular or irregular. If it is irregular, it is still VT until proven otherwise. You can't say it's atrial fibrillation of the aberrancy. So you treat it as VT until proven otherwise. If it's regular broad complex tachycardia, it's VT. If it's irregular broad complex tachycardia, it could be atrial fibrillation of the aberrancy, but you're going to treat it as a VT until proven otherwise, or it could be polymorphic VT. So these are the two options that you have. So like I said again, it's either you can say it's a VT or it's a regular broad complex tachycardia. Any comment on the axis on the CCG? Why do you think it's a VT? Why can't it be an SVT with aberrancy? Why can't it, it, it be any kind of SVT with aberrancy? Why, it is, why do you think it's a VT compared to uh, SVT with bundle branch block? So me, when I learned, I just have to draw everything before I can learn everything. So let me just go back. So if you look at the ECG lead placement, you have lead V1, V2 on the chest, just to orient with it. And you have V3, 4, 5, and 6 onwards over here. So your depolarization is from SA node to the AV node to the, towards the apex. So anything in the AV node, it's going away from the V1 
So all the deflections in V1 is going to be negative. If you see the QRS complex on ECG, it's always going to be negative. Compared to V5, V6, it's going to be positive deflection unless you have a, a poor R wave progression. But in normal ECG, because the depolarization is going this way towards the apex of the heart, you will see V1 and V2, the QRS complex is almost always negative concurrent negative, which I can show over here. You can see the QRS complex is almost always negative. But in this case, if you look at it, the, v, the QRS complex is positive, which means something is coming towards the AV node. So which means the depolarization is actually happening from the ventricle towards this side. So that's why you see it's turned down, flipped opposite. So which means it's highly unlikely coming from the top chamber. It's coming from the bottom chamber. If it's a broad complex tachycardia, which is going towards that way, and if it is depolarized that way, it most often is a VT. There are a few clues that can give you if it's a VT, which is if you have a long strip, you can still see a capture beat, which is a normal sinus rhythm going through it, even though the ventricle is taking over and doing much things, still you have SA node function. So you can actually have a capture beat, which is like a normal PQRST happening through it. And you can have a fusion beat, which is a normal beat, and this beat fused together. We can see the morphology is completely different. So these are the clues that can tell you, is it a VT or SVT? I think this is upside down. Uh, so this is your normal PQRST, I'm sorry about this. So that, those are the clues that can give you to differentiate between SVT with aberrancy or with VT. So you're looking for a capture beat, which is a normal QRS complex happening uh, between those things because your SA node is still functioning. You can still see some slipping through it, or you can see a fusion beat, which is a mixture of this beat and this beat together. So the morphology is completely different from all. So that's, those are the few clues that can give you to differentiate between a VT from SVT. How are you going to treat this patient now? He's an ED, so he's come with palpitations. His blood pressure is 95 or 60 systolic. He's sitting and talking to you. What are you going to do for this gentleman? Anyone? Who thinks I'm going to defibrillate this patient? Is defibrillation the right thing to do for him? Or are you going to cardio water? him? Or are you going to give him some drugs? So three options. So, so the, the cardio version of the cardio version um, option. Yeah. Uh, from um, and there's a drugs option. So we have two views. So you can have a cardio version option, or you can give drugs. Most most preferred drug is amiodarone. You can give amiodarone. See what happens. Cardio version. If you're more if you're more worried about it, you can go for cardio version. Again, it's going to be synchronized cardio version. Make sure you synchronize it to the QRS complex and cardio with them. Otherwise, on your drone, still as per ACLS guidelines, you can still give them. It's a VT with a pulse. You still treat it as a VT with a pulse. If they have a good cardiac output, you can still give them on your drone. If you don't want to cardio with them, or if you're not comfortable cardio with them before you can get a cardiologist or somebody senior to come and help you, you can still give them on your drone and see what happens. So that is something you can do for them. Is that okay? So the reason. Last, I asked somebody, this is a chap who was a 60-year-old man who had a PCI, was in CCU resting, and all of a sudden he had a cardiac arrest. We resisted him successfully. And then we went back and looked back into strips, see what happened. So basically what happened was, as you can see, he has a PQRST, he has a PVC coming on, and again, normal QRS complex, PVC coming on. And then again, he goes into this polymorphic VT over here, or of course, VF, whichever you can describe it. Uh, anybody knows what happened over here? Can anybody tell what happened over here, especially over here? So literally what happened was a PVC fell on a T wave and then activated them to go into VF is what exactly happened. This is what you call an R on T phenomenon. Usually the, P, the PVCs happen after T wave, but sometimes what happens is this PVC can fall on T wave and actually can cause a polymorph, can cause polymorph VT or can cause torsar or VF, I'm sorry about that. So this can happen. So this is what can happen if somebody, you cardio word, this is exactly what happens if you cardio word somebody and you don't synchronize and if it falls on a T wave, you are at risk of running into this one. So that's why if you're going to cardio word somebody, you always synchronize with the QRS complex. If you don't synchronize, this is what can happen. If the current falls on the T wave, you're pushing them into this arrhythmia. So you're taking somebody with atrial fibrillation and giving them a VF. All agree with this? All right, this is another gentleman, no, again, irregular, broad complex tachycardia, polymorphic VT. As you can see, current has been charged over here, is about to be cardioverted and shocked and bought that rhythm. 
So just matter of time, I just want to take my points. So take my points, any kind of tachyarrhythmia, you always want to see what the hemodynamic status is. Check for symptoms. Are they having active syncope, dizziness, shortness of breath, chest pain, or heart failure? That sometimes can help. Stable VT or SVT drugs can still be considered unstable. You're going to cardiovert no matter what type of rhythm you have. So unstable, you're going to cardiovert them. This is my take home points from my teaching today. Thank you very much. That's the end of part one of my teaching. I'm happy to take any questions. I hope it was okay and I didn't go too fast. Any questions at all? Or shall we just move on to the next uh, section? Uh, I just, uh, Sachin, I took the liberty to uh, put the TDP as, you know, as a kind of question in, in relation to the last ECG, yes. you, you should, you know, you sure. So, um, and then it'll be good to, um, for people to think about what all could cause uh, that thing, and perhaps hypokalemia, long yeah. QT, et cetera, et cetera, would be causing that sort of a a polymorphic VT or, mm -hmm. or yes. SATs. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, one of the emergencies in cardiology, which uh, you come across very often now and then. So, yeah, I think you can just uh, carry on over the next uh, bit. Okay. Thanks. So, I hope this will be pretty quick enough. I won't be talking much about this. It's about pharmacology. Um, so, again, this is just an introduction slide. So, the most treatment for heart failure has been, it's been going on for longer, but again, the standard research and trials has been coming up in the 90s and 80s as to which is good for heart. So as you can see, the most early research are solved, solved two, which all use enalapril, at least, uh, or ramapril, uh, all this medication to show that there is cardiac remodeling uh, that helps with mortality and everything with HOPE trial, which used ramapril as a drug to show that these patients who had uh, poor early function post MI or had heart failure did much better. So there is quite a lot of trials just trying to say what these ACE inhibitors do in regards to heart failure, hypotension, in stroke prevention, or in having pretty good, pretty good MACE outcomes. So again, these are ARBs. The reason why we started to do ACE and ARB is because there is a couple of drugs that we compared between ACE and ARBs. The amount of benefit that you got from ACE compared to ARB was not the same. So a ARB was not had a similar cardiac mortality benefit compared to ACE. So that's why we tend to give ACE inhibitors as a first line of drug compared to ARBs. If people are not able to tolerate ACE inhibitors, then we choose ARBs. Again, it's not a complete thing like you, nobody should have ARBs. You can still give ARBs, but the benefit of ACE is much more better compared to ARBs. I think CHARM is a trial that compared Walsartan with Enalapil and found out Enalapil had much better MACE outcomes compared to Walsartan. Doesn't mean Walsatam well, didn't have MACE outcome. It did have it, but comparatively, uh, Charm had a better, ACE had a better uh, mortality outcome compared to this. So that's why we tend to give anybody who has MI to have early uh, ACE inhibitor introduction was much better for these people compared to delayed ACE inhibitors that was given for them. So as you can see, there is quite a lot of studies that keep on checking for blood pressure control. Um, for heart failure treatments has been pretty much going on for longer, but it hasn't nothing hasn't been changed recently. The one recent change that we can get is that when somebody gets heart failure, you have quite a lot of system that has been activated. One is renin angiotensin system. This is what most of the treatment was targeting to block it, um, to work on renin angiotensin system. But again, there is another new interest was nepralyzin inhibitor, which is a scabotrol, which blocked nepralyzin inhibitors, which in turn caused natriuresis, decreased fibrosis in heart uh, and everything and decreased uh, afterload and heart well and was much beneficial in people with heart failure. So then what medication they came up with is what we'll talk about. So what it does is nepalesin is a hormone that is introduced, which is a neutral endopeptidase, which degrades this natural peptides that is produced in the body, bradycanin and adrenomodulin. By blocking this, what happens is you're going to stop this peripheral acid constriction, you're going to stop the sodium retention, and you're going to cause postural remodeling in the heart. So that's what nepralyzin can cause. So by inhibiting it, you're going to counteract all these kind of negative mechanisms this nepralyzin is going to cause. So the medication that we're going to talk more is called uh, scabotrol plus Walsartan together. It's called an entresto. So the RAS pathway 
causes blocking that can cause counteractive effect of the sodium retention, can, can stop vasoconstriction, can stop hypertrophy of the heart muscle and also can cause inhibit the fibrosis. And by nebulizing inhibitors, again, you're going to cause more natriuresis, you're going to cause peripheral acid dilatation, and you're going to inhibit this fibrosis. So these two together help a lot. Again, from my first talk, I said ACE inhibitors are better than Valsartan. Why don't we why don't we mix ACE inhibitor with scabutal? The reason why it wasn't mixed is because when they did ACE inhibitor with scabutal, there was quite a lot of angioedema. So they stopped using ACE inhibitor along with scabutal. So they kind of went for a second line with the Valsartan and they found it was much better compared to ACE inhibitor alone. The first trial that talked about it was a paradigm heart failure trial. So what they did was they gave people Entresto, which is scabutal and Valsartan, and they just gave people Enalapril, compared them both almost 2,000 people in each hand and randomize them and see what happened with them in regards to primary endpoint with heart failure, hospitalization, or cardiovascular death. As you can clearly see with the Kaplan-Meier curve, even at early onset, the curve just separates and it shows in the longer term, Interesto did much better compared to people who had not been Interesto on an approach. So this curve is quite significant when it comes to cardiac mortality and benefit. So this was trial predominantly in heart failure with reduced situation fraction. So subsequently, the question was, uh, can people with heart failure preserve ejection fraction benefit from it as well? So there is trials that is, uh, they didn't show much bit of promise, isn't it, Dr. Thakur? Heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction interest or didn't do much compared to with heart failure with reduced, reduced ejection fraction? No, I think there was, there was a subset study which, uh, in diabetics which um, perhaps showed some benefit, but otherwise there's very little benefit in preserved benefit ejection, preserved ejection fraction. Interest, so that's right. And also, um, that uh, patients have to be on other contemporary therapies uh, in order to get the maximum prognostic benefit. Uh, that's another key thing to emphasize at this point when you're wanting to add this or replace the ACE or ARB with this option, dual inhibition. So it's again, the same slide. I just want to say the other slides. And again, you can see uh, admission with heart failure compared to anaerobic, you don't see that early benefit at, at six months, but when it goes up to one year or when you go further more, you can actually see a clear benefit of interest in the longer term. Again, when it comes to death from any cause, you don't see that early benefit uh, at six months, but again, when you see at one year, there's a clear separation of the curves and it gives a better benefit when it compares with ACE inhibitor to interest. So that's why this drug has been come up as a, a better drug for people with heart failure with reduced ejection infraction. So what we do is, if somebody is on ACE inhibitor, you can switch them to Entresto, but given that they are ACE and ARBs, you have to actually give them a washout period of 36 hours. So which means for 36 hours, you should stop the Enlapril or Ramapril, Perindopril, whichever it is, stop it for 36 hours, and then you're able to restart with the Valsartan Scabotrol medication. If somebody is already on an ARB, like a Telmisartan or Valsartan, there is no need for washout period. You can start it straight away, all right? The washout period is only when somebody has a, a, been on ACE inhibitor. If they're an ARB, you are free to start them straight away. Because it's two pathway blockage, so always think about side effects, about hypotension. Uh, it's one thing that can be a bit of a Achilles heel for this medication sometimes. They can get profound hypertension and that cannot be titrated. So as you can see our ESC guidelines in heart failure that was updated, has given a class 1B indication for anybody with heart failure admissions, capital well certain, to replace ACE inhibitor, to reduce heart failure admissions or death in any patient with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. So think about scabotrol and well certain. Is that okay? So the next trial that I'm going to talk about is, so these patients, ideally what happened was, that was in 2015, 2016 is when the paradigm heart failure came. So everybody kind of started giving uh, interest to us on an outpatient basis and try to operate it was taking much more longer. So then there was a new trial last year, they published, or 2019, they published a pioneer heart failure trial, where they actually uh, initiated interest in acute heart failures and see what happened. Um, so again, as you can see, the primary or secondary outcomes of it is that worsening renal function was almost same compared to ACE inhibitors and scapital and certain. Hyperkalemia, slightly higher, but still not big difference. Symptomatic hypotension, almost similar. Very little people got angioedema because it's ARB compared to ACE inhibitor. And again, if you have to do more analysis of it, you can see composite death, hospitalization, the heart failure was significantly reduced. And again, uh, use of additional heart failure drugs significantly reduced. Use of increased dose of diuretics, again, little bit reduced. 
the main trial was about was to see what it does for NT pro BNP. And again, you can see if they are given in in hospital at one week or within eight weeks time, you can see a significant reduction in NT pro BNP compared to ACE inhibitor. So again, somebody who is in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, you can actually think of starting them on Entresto directly rather than going on ACE inhibitors. Um, so that has also shown to prove to re bring to reduce the heart failure admissions and also has a good cardiac mortality benefit. So that is something you can think about rather than just starting on ACE inhibitors. If they're able to tolerate it, definitely. And if they're not having symptomatic hypotension, definitely can start them on a Entresto on a low dose and then trying to up titrate it. So this is one of the new medications that is more up and coming, which is shown to have better cardiac mortality benefit and reducing hospital admissions for anybody with hospital with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Moving on to my next slide is these two medications is SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP1 agonists. So these are all diabetic medications. And you can ask me, what are you doing talking about diabetic medications and heart failure? Well, so it's just a small thing. GLP-1 is something that stimulates and releases insulin in the pancreas, and HCL2 inhibitors are HCL2 proteins in the kidneys, which plays an important role in the absorption of glucose in the kidneys and causes uh, glycose and it inhibits glycosuria. So by giving HCL2 inhibitors, you're causing glycosuria. All right. So what it does is this: is what it does. It works in proximal canal tubule, um, sodium glucose transport channel, and it actually causes glycosuria in these people. Um, so it also causes a bit of vasoconstriction after natural. So some people does have a bit of AK in early stages, but again, that is not seen in the longer term benefit. So uh, close monitoring is warranted, but again, it, is, it has shown in recent trials that it is not causing a major concern that people don't have significant reduced reduction in, um, in kidney functions. So when you have quite a lot of glycosuria, so glucose being glucose, it also attracts water. So it can cause quite a lot of natriuresis and just people tend to pee out which means you're putting less pressure on the heart. So you're decreasing the afflow on the heart. So that also helps in cardiac remodeling. So what diabetes does in people when it comes to cardiac myocytes is that it can cause some left ventral hypertrophy. It can cause inflammation in cytokines. It causes remodeling in the heart. It causes apoptosis in cells. So because of microvascular dysfunction. So when you give SGL2 inhibitors, it actually causes decrease in fibrosis it, called, it also helps in uh, decreasing LV remodeling, decreasing inflammation in cells. Quite a lot of benefit that it gives in these people who are on SGLT2 inhibitors. So the mechanisms, as you can see, the most commonly used are DDP4, GLP1, and SGLT inhibitors. It has effects on almost every single tissues and bodies and uh, every single organ in your bodies. In kidneys, it can cause natriuresis when it comes to SGLT2. DDP4, they had multiple trials comparing see if it has any kind of cardiac mortality. But again, in heart failures and everything, it hasn't shown any kind of benefit in reducing heart failure, uh, except for saxagliptin, which actually caused increase in heart failures. So if somebody has heart failure, and if they're on saxagliptin, it's worthwhile to think them to stop stopping them that uh, DDP4 of saxagliptin. Is there any sulfonylureas can somebody, or thalidomides? Can somebody tell me that should be stopped in heart failure? Does anybody know? Anything about any medication that you don't want to give in people with diabetic and heart failure? Any comments? Yes, there's a, there's a comment on pyoglitism contraindicated. The two exactly, yes. Yeah. So look into medications, anybody who has diabetes, and if they're on pyoglitism and heart failure, it's a contraindication. It worsens heart failure. So that is something to stop. And again, think um, about uh, DDP4. Yeah, there's a comment on thiazolidium uh, and on. And then next thing is going to be saxagliptin, which almost always comes with the mixture with metformin. So look into your metformin medication, see what it is. If your patient is having recurrent heart failure admissions, again, think about that medication. So medication, something when patient comes with these kind of diabetes, heart failure, coronary disease, they almost always have polypharmacy. So it's very good on day one. You just look into all the medications, see which is more appropriate, which is more inappropriate. Try to stop it. It's worthwhile to spend that first day to spend much more time with the patients to know exactly what's going on not just with the symptoms, but also with their medications. So you can actually add on medications like SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1, which is going to be much more beneficial for them rather than some medication which is not going to be beneficial for them. All right? So why do I say insist on SGLT2 inhibitors? Because quite a lot of trials that looked into SGLT2 inhibitors, like MPARH, CANVAS, which looked into can canaglipazolin, and Vertis, which looked into 
and some kind of liver sulfur. I'm sorry, I don't remember it. So they all looked into multiple disease, uh, multiple uh, multiple patients with diabetes, and all the endpoints was that they had better outcomes when it comes to cardiovascular death or strokes. And then next thing was it turned towards heart failures. So DAPA heart failure, emperor reduced, are the two major heart failures where they had almost 8,000 patients uh, together when they gave them uh, DAPA glipazole and heart failure because of the natural urus and everything, these people actually had a better cardiovascular outcomes and they had reduced heart failure admission almost by 29 to 30%. Uh, so quite increased uh, benefit in these people. So again, if somebody has heart failure, it doesn't have to be diabetes. Even without diabetes, people are getting much more better benefits with DAPA glipazole. So if you look at people with heart failure, even with the diabetes, they tend to get much better outcome because of the natural uresis. They get um, uh, better cardiovascular outcomes and benefits. And again, they gave uh, empaglifazole in, in heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Again, that also showed better cardiovascular outcomes and maze in these people as well. So again, more and more these medications, which are diabetic medication, which are used in heart failure, is shown to give better cardiovascular outcome because of glycosuria. Given that they're going to have glycosuria, they're more prone to have UTIs and everything. So if somebody who's prone to have UTIs is better to have the chat because this can actually cause them to have recurrent urinary tract infections. So it's better to have the chat as well. And second thing, people with type 2 diabetes and people who put on, um, on SGL2 inhibitors, they are at risk of getting what you call as acute glycemic ketoacidosis. So in acute settings, in, in, in acute heart failure settings, when you're actively diuresing, or in starvation sometimes most often is when they get this uh, euglycemic ketoacidosis. So be very careful when somebody is a diabetic and you are, have them on empagliflozole. If they're having some form of, um, uh, that's not a, a behaving well like hyper, sorry, it's a hyperventilating, which is unusual. They could be just compensating because of acidosis or whichever it is. So just look into them much more carefully and worthwhile to do a VBG at least to see if they're getting acidotic from the medications and worthwhile to hold it and recommence it back again. So this is our MPRH and canvas. So this is a hazard ratio. So anything before this curve is beneficial, anything after this curve is harmful. As you can see, people with no HGR heart failure, the outcome is so much better for them. And people even with heart failure, if you put them on dapagliposol, they do much good. So there is quite net benefit. It's quite better with these people with empagliposol or canagliposol. So these people with heart failure should be on, with diabetes, should be on these medications if they're not on it. So GLP-1, so this is cardiovascular outcome trials. So again, they looked into much of these medications, lixinatide, liraglutide, sinaglutide. So there was six or eight trials that compared cardiovascular outcome of this medication, of which liraglutide was the only big trial that showed net benefit in uh, reducing cardiovascular outcomes, stroke, and maize in these people. Otherwise, rest of them all showed was non-inferior to placebo. So still there is benefit. So the guidelines still recommend uh, GLP-1 should be considered as early medication that can be given for diabetics with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because it does have a net clinical benefit when it comes to overall uh, in cardiovascular death and mortality in these people. So going back into the slide, which American Heart Diabetes Association that has recently released, sorry, this is a busy slide. Uh, just ignore the one on the right side because this is one who doesn't have any kind of cardiovascular risk factors, but who has cardiovascular risk factor, risk factor CKD or heart failure. If you follow this algorithm, you can see anyone with heart failure with, with, with reduced HGN fraction you start off with metformin, but you always, almost always had SGLT inhibitors. CKD, again, add on SGLT inhibitors or GLP. Again, look at this one. You can either add a GLP-1 or SGLT-2. So these are all more proven, better cardiovascular outcome for these people. So it's better to get these people on this medication, which is proven uh, much better net clinical benefit when it comes to all sorts of cardiovascular outcomes and heart failure in these people. So try to follow this algorithm and see if you can follow this for these people who, could, who you can potentially help them from stopping them from getting into heart failure admissions and improve their cardiovascular outcomes. Thank you very much. I just want to keep it short because I've been talking for longer. Any questions? Anything that I have to say, Dr. Rocker, or I hope I covered um, everything that you're looking for for the FI2s? No, thanks, uh, thanks, Sachin. I think uh, uh, that has been quite comprehensive and quite a good uh, review.